The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Charney Report. And we have a very exceptional guest today. She's a woman named Vanessa Lapa. She's a documentarian. The idea to do The Decent One and the idea to do a documentary film on Heinrich Himmler began in Israel when Leon took me together with Professor Lahore at Chaim Rosenthal to see this collection. And this collection contained the all private correspondence and diaries of Heinrich Himmler and his family between the years 1927 until 1945. And after a few weeks of hesitation, when I decided to, to pick up the challenge, I started to transcribe and translate the content of the collection, because everything is written in ancient German. So it was transcribed in modern German and then translated into English and Hebrew in order for us to understand and to write a script. So this is how, this is where the idea came from. The, the, the collection gave me the, the idea of making a film. And once we started to, to transcribe and to translate, we realized the, the richness of the text and the amount of text that is there. And that in the text itself, there is enough to tell a whole story without interviewing anyone, without having any external intervention. That we shall do it only with the words of Himmler and his family, his parents, his wife, his daughter, and his subordinates. The decent one comes from, it's a translation from the German word, word Der Anständige. And it comes from it comes from him. His most famous speech is the speech he gave in 1943 in Poznan, and this is a speech of four hours, where he explains how decency is important and how one can kill and murder and do horrible things in a decent way. In the research, he's using the word decent above thousand times and in the film he's using the word decent 13 times. So in 90 minutes he's using the word decent 13 times. This is, de for me, the decent one is in one word reflecting the whole perversion of this man. And for him, decency was what he believed most in and the way he educated his children and his subordinates and a whole nation, and he strongly believed that he was a decent man and that the German soldiers and the German officers were decent, and he educated them to kill in a decent way. Brief Nummer 145. Du liebe, süße kleine Frau. Gutes Liebe. Wie schön wird unser Heim. Einfach herrlich. Die Bäume und Sträucher haben sehr gut angesetzt. Mit Maler und Elektriker schließe ich morgen endgültig ab. Ich lege dir einen Zettel bei mit den Fensterabmessungen. Die Küche gab ich an gelblich, Treppenhaus blau-grau, Schlafzimmer hellgrün, Marktzimmer eine helle Farbe, Fremdenzimmer ebenfalls eine helle Farbe. Wie herrlich wird unser Leben sein. Unsere reine, tiefe Liebe von Seele und Leib. Liebste Frau, wie habe ich dich lieb. Von unserem Heim, unserer Burg. Da wird alles Schmutzige ferngehalten. Dein Mann. Himmler was, as far as I, as far as I read biographies in my life, Himmler is probably the most brutal, perverted man I know. 
he was brutal not only with the Jews or with the people in his public life, he was brutal in his private life as well. He is a seemingly loving father, a seemingly loving husband, but his brutality in, in the subtext, of course, comes out also in his private writings. When he writes to his wife before they get married that he loves her very much, but that there is something that he loves more, and this is the nation, it is something brutal. It is not a parent's brutality, he's not hitting her. Himmler had one child with his wife and adopted a son with his wife, and then he had two children with his mistress. Everyone is dead, the only child that is still alive is Gudrun Himmler, his biological daughter he had with Marga. She is still alive, she's 84, and she lives in Munich. She is um, the founder of an organization that is called Stille Hilfe, Silent Aid, and this is an organization that raises a lot, a lot of money every year in order to financially support former Nazi war criminals which are convicted. So they are sending, it's an organization who is sending Christmas presents, money, psychological support to the convicted Nazis that are in prison. And about 20 and 30 years ago, this organization helped those Nazis to escape, to get false identities, to, to have a new life outside of Germany. Well, the German reaction to Silent Aid is something we don't know because Silent Aid is not an official organization. Officially, it's, of course, an organization that cannot exist. So the, the, um, the organization exists. The, the bank accounts are not under the name of Silent Aid. The people in the academy who knows about the organization are, of course, fighting the organization. They're writing reviews and they're trying to raise the, the public awareness that such an organization exists. So no, there is no one who officially supports um, Gudrun Himmler's organization, Silent Aid. Well, I tried to interview Gudrun since I have the collections. For the last seven years, I, I not me directly, but through the, the German researchers and the team we had in Germany to offer her her diary. And then she would give us an interview. She didn't want to. She didn't want to have a diary and just to talk to the camera alone. And the last two years, I just offered her to give her diary and just to meet with me off the record, but she didn't accept. I do have a relationship with Katrin Himmler. Katrin Himmler is the great niece of Heinrich Himmler. She she's actually the granddaughter of Himmler's youngest brother, and she's totally the opposite of Gudrun Himmler. Gudrun Himmler is not talking to Katrin. Katrin, since she she's fifteen and she realized that she's a family member of Himmler, she devoted all her life in research and in trying to understand to she wrote a book 12 years ago about the Himmler brothers she's an academic a sociologist and she's lecturing all over the world about the second world war about Himmler and trying to make sure that people are aware of it she's she's very she's she bears the the responsibility of the family and when um, we got the collection. She, together with Professor Ville, they wrote a new book that is based on the content of the collection and on the correspondence between Marga Himmler and Heinrich Himmler. The opening and the closing of the movie is actually the interrogation that the American soldiers did with Marga in 1945. And this interrogation was recorded, but the recording of it does not exist anymore. The transcription of it exists. We found it during the research in the NARA, National Archives, in Washington. So in the film, we took the first part, the beginning of the interrogation, and the end of the interrogation. The 
investigator is asking the questions in English and Marga is answering in German, exactly like in the film. So the film is 100% accurate to Marga's interrogation. Um, if Marga knew about the content of the work of Himmler is a very good question. I'm sure, obviously, she knew because he's writing that he's going to Auschwitz, he's writing that he's going to visit some new shooting methods, he's telling her about the difficulties of the war, up to what extent he told her what he did in Auschwitz and what the meetings that he's mentioning over and over again, his meetings with Hitler and the fact that he has having lunch with Hitler and that they made plans and that I don't know up to what extent she knew. Of course she knew she was anti-Semitic, you see it. Diese Judengeschichte. Wann wird das Pack uns verlassen, damit man auch seines Lebens froh wird? I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. I think that to be able, the ability to tell the story from the point of view of the German side is something that my generation starts to be able to do. I think that the second generation is obviously is not able for, for obvious reason to to tell the same story from the angle of the perpetrators. I didn't do the film because I'm third generation. I did the film because I saw this collection and I understood the importance of the content of it. And I was challenged by the artistic way to tell the story. Today I realized that Probably the the that my my direct connection to the Holocaust is is small in in the bigger story. It's a way bigger story than the Holocaust, which is big enough, but it's a way bigger story than the Holocaust and then Heinrich Himmler and his family. But the the big question that people ask is, how did you get such access to this guy? The man who kept the collection is an Israeli man named Chaim Rosenthal, and he kept the collection under his bed for 40 years. The way he got the collection will remain forever unclear, but what is clear is that he got it in the early 60s from a flea market, whether in America or in Europe, which was very common in those years, which is still when you go on flea markets, you can find letters, postcards, you, you can find things. So, so the, the, this kind of materials is going from hands to hands since the end of the war. It happened in, in all the countries, in all post-war areas. Um, the reason Rosenthal, um, Rosenthal never told anyone, including his son, how exactly he got the collection. He told that he got it from a flea market. Um, the reason why, today I can understand why the collection paralyzed him. Because he got it and he, he, he didn't know what he has. And it is frightening, it is bigger than life, it is paralyzing. So unless you immediately start to do something and to work with it and to create something, I realized that it could paralyze someone. So Rosenthal was on the one hand obsessed by the collection, on the other hand he didn't know what to do with it. He was very much afraid that it would arrive to the wrong hands, meaning to neo-Nazis or going back to the market. So he, it was very important for him 
that this collection doesn't arrive to the wrong hands. And the combination of both made that he kept the collection and, and didn't know exactly what to do with him until 2000. And he didn't know what to do with the collection until 2006 when he finally, but it was a process because in 2006 he finally decided um, with the strong help of his son to, to get rid of it. But not to get, just to get rid of it, to get rid of it um, and give it to someone who, who will do something important with it. Laut Anordnung unseres Führers vom 6. Januar 1929 habe ich die Führung der SS der NSDAP übernommen. Bei Neuaufnahmen von SS-Mitgliedern ersuche ich besonders zu beachten, dass die Bedingungen sind. 23 Jahre Mindestalter, Mindestgröße 1,70 Meter, ein Jahr Parteimitgliedschaft, schriftliche Benennung zweier Zeugen, die auch wirklich für den Mann eintreten können. Er muss auch menschlich gut und anständig sein. Von 100 Mann können wir im Durchschnitt allenfalls 10 oder 15, brauchen wir nicht. Wir verlangen das politische Neumannszeugnis der Eltern und Geschwister. Wir verlangen die Ahnentafel bis 1750. Wir werden in dieser Organisation möglichst viele Menschen, die zu einem namhaften Teilträger dieses erwünschten Blutes sind, aus dem deutschen Volk erfassen und unter soldatischen Gehorsam bringen. My reflection on Himmler trying to be decent is probably the most unexplainable thing because whatever is decent to me, to us, is 180 degrees not decent for Himmler. And whatever is decent for Himmler is totally indecent for us. So so the, the contradiction in the in the most deep way of the sense of the word decency is totally perverted by Himmler. Himmler perverts the word decent in the most extensive and dangerous way because he strongly believed that what he was doing was decent. And we all know that what he was doing was everything but decent. I do think that Himmler was functioning in the reality that allowed him to function, which is the reality of a nation, a system, a, a culture. He was part of it. He was not just someone who, who fitted into a system. He was part of the, the creation of this system. He was with Hitler since 1925. Since Hitler came out of prison, they were together. He met Himmler very young. So what I believe is that Himmler didn't have to convince Himmler on anything. Hitler fitted exactly to what Himmler was looking for because he, he his background and what he believed in and what he wanted to do, he found his man in Hitler. Hitler was the most dominant person in Himmler's life. You, one can realize it from the correspondence between Himmler and his father. It's very clear that the parallel to his getting closer and closer to Hitler and raising to power, his neglecting his relationship with his parents, neglecting his relationship with his wife. It's very clear when you put the letters to his wife and the letters to his parents near the political occupations of, of Himmler that Hitler took the place of everyone in Himmler's life. The father of Himmler was a teacher a Bavarian high bourgeoisie uh, teacher at school, very intellectual. The mother of Himmler was a Catholic, very, very Catholic 
Bavarian woman. Anyway, we'll cut for a break. We'll show you some more clips. It's uh, quite interesting, Israel. We'll be right back after a break. We're back. I'm Leon Charney. I'm talking to Vanessa Lapa, who's created a, a brilliant documentary about Omar as Prime Minister, a day in the life of the Prime Minister, who has been um, restrained uh, from showing this on Channel 2 because they say, quote, the mood of the country does not like Omar today and therefore they don't want to see this uh, film shown. I myself think you're a great documentarian. I know you're producing a new uh, documentary on the Himmler Diaries and I know that's your cause and that's your passion. The bad economical situation before Hitler and what Hitler managed to do at the first stage raising the improving the economical situation in Germany, which after that um, went down again, is what, you know, is what made, I believe, the, the, the mass of the population to follow Hitler, because Hitler gave them uh, a solution. He didn't he didn't explain his hatred to the Jews. Hitler didn't explain his hatred to the Jews in front of the population. He knew exactly what to tell the population. And there was a big economical situation. So he was the one who would save them from the economical situation, which he did. But no one asked, how will he do this? Well, you know, the Nazi campaign against the Jews was brilliant in their point of view, of course, because the, the, the chief of propaganda was a brilliant man and he managed to, to cat caricaturize the Jew as the one who is the source of all problems. But it's not only the Jews. There were problems, there was a bad economic situation, there was a huge frustration of the, the, the First World War. So everything together made, brought the, the Nazi propaganda machine to find a guilty, who is guilty of having brought Germany to lose the First World War, who is guilty of the economical situation in Germany. So the Jews were the easy target. Um, there is obviously, um, not obviously, unfortunately, um, there is a parallel and there are reminders of the blame that Hitler and the Nazi had toward the Jews and the blame that the world has today towards the Jews and towards Israel. There is a parallel. This is why I believe that we should be very much aware of where this blame can bring a culture, where this blame can bring people, where this blame can be bring countries. I feel as, as a human being, as a citizen of, as a citizen of, of, of humanity, I, I, I am very much afraid when I learned and inserted the, the mind of, of a man like, like Himmler and a, a system like the Third Reich, I'm very, very much afraid 
when I see what is happening today. Most of the, the family of my mother perished in, in Auschwitz and Birkenau. She's still, she's very, on the one hand, very modern, and on the other hand, she's the, the, the product of uh, the second generation of Holocaust survivors. She's very much um, the product of, of someone who grew up with Holocaust survivors, very much. The books she's reading, the fear she has, the, the sense of, of victim, the, the fear when there is any anti-Semite action in Europe, immediately the, the, to take it personally and to be afraid that in a second it will be a disaster. Um, so she's very much traumatized by, by her parents who, who, you know, at the end of the day came back from, from Auschwitz and from Dachau and the parents of my father were taken from Belgium and their parents and brothers and sisters and families and the parents of my mother were taken from Poland. My grandfather's side from Bendin in Poland and my grandmother from Częstochowa. They were taken from there to all kinds of working camps, concentration camps and extermination camps. The parents of my father are still, are still alive. My, the father of my mother passed away and my grandmother passed away two years ago. None of them really spoke about it. I was very young, so I didn't ask enough questions. This I realized today. They didn't talk about it. My grandmother, um, who lived in New York for the last 20 years of her life, at the end of her life, because of the project, I started to, she knew about the project, she knew what I was doing, she was very, very supportive. I started to ask questions. She, she barely answered. From time to time she was starting to tell me a story of what she's been through and after a few sentences she, she said, leave it with me. I cannot talk about it. When I asked it the, the last years, I, I thought that, that not only it's very sad, that it's, it's a very big problem because even though her story wouldn't make a difference for, for my film. I think that all those stories should be told and should be recorded. Should they, all those people should tell their stories. So we have in 10 years, in 20 years, in 100 years, uh, testimonies of their stories. Those stories should be told. So I felt that it's, it's too bad that they are not telling the story and it's a generation that, you know, I remember telling my grandmother, maybe you go to, to a psychologist to talk to him so, so you will be able to tell the story even if you don't tell me the story, just for you to tell the story, to write it down. But it's a generation that doesn't go so easily to, to psychologists and, and doesn't, they just didn't, fortunately for us, a lot are telling their stories. But there are still a lot that are not telling and they are going and, and passing away. And I hope that the film will help people to remember and raise the debate and re-raise the debate. And we're building an educational plan because we, we realize how important it is to, to keep the debate going and going. How how it's never, then it's never too much, even if it is another Holocaust story, even if it is again about the Second World War. I think that, of course, as, as a filmmaker, as an artist, you need to find creative ways to tell the same story. But in, in, the, in the purely academic sense, mm. every story needs to be told and retold, and the awareness needs to and I hope that the film, I really hope that the film will have an, an educational impact and will be another, another reason to, 
to remember and to talk about it and make sure it's what is going on now today in the world, whether it is the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, whether it is the the rise of, of racism all over the world is that um, the roots, the ideologies, the ideas are the same. And the other thing that is the same and that is very frightening is that those, theor those theories are at the end of the day brought into practice by human beings like Himmler. I don't think that it is easy to build a system like the Third Reich and the Nazis, but I do think that because it's the, the handwork of human beings and because it happened, it can happen again. Um, one of the things we, we realized during the, the making of this film is on the one hand, the educational importance, so we're going to work hard on the educational program of the Himmler collection. On the other hand, we realized the amount of archive material that is stored in big archives and that is kept in private families, with private families, and they don't know what is on the reels. And the importance of it is, is huge. And every day that goes by, the, the time is damaging the, the film reel and the content. And there may be such important information on it. So the next project is to be able to, to raise the, the attention on the importance of the visual history of the Jewish heritage and the state of Israel. And try to to raise the money for it and to get to as many film results possible before it's too late. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the entire country comes to a standstill. There is a howling of sirens for a two-minute silence. And virtually traffic is stopped, people stop, everything is halted. One cannot imagine the eerie feeling that this is. However, it evidently has a fantastic impact on this country because you can feel the serenity and the mellow feelings of the people. Tonight, virtually nothing is open that can commemorate anything that feels like happiness. You cannot go to a restaurant outside. You cannot uh, obviously go to a movie theater. The television, the radio play songs to commemorate things that are uh, feelings of sadness, feelings of memorial for six million Jews who perished and others who perished also. This is also a tribute to non-Jews and our commemoration to people who have perished by virtue of wicked, hatred-filled men perished under the feelings and thoughts of Adolf Hitler, Goebbels, Speer, and so on. It's ecumenical in its aspects. I have seen many, many non-Jewish people come here and virtually fall to tears. And where were you during the war? Uh, in Poland. Were you in a concentration camp? No. You were in the underground? In the underground. And how did you survive? Uh, I... We escaped to Hungary. We are not together. We met in Budapest. You, in the underground. You're too young to be together <laughs> at that age. How old were you when you were escaping? And Kama, you ben Kama He was 18 years old when uh, he began to make his uh, escape. Until 1943, the year 1943, you were in the Machterat of Poland. Slovakia, Gul Slovakia, Hungaria. You escaped through Slovakia and Hungary. No, he found a way to escape. He was sent by the way. underground to uh, the um, Beskid uh, mountains, okay. and he found a connection with the smugglers. At that time, there was smuggling uh, many, uh, I don't know, vodka or something. 
and he um, became friend with his smugglers and um, convinced them to smuggle people. Why were you selected today to light a candle, which I understand is a very big honor? But do you understand how those people are selected? There are many people who are Holocaust victims in this country. Evidently, you have been exemplary. You have done something uh, special to be... You were the leader? One of the leaders. Commanders. One of the leaders. And you think that's why you were chosen to... Yes, and come uh, because of that... אנחנו uh, הצלנו הרבה, כל הקבוצה, העברתי אותם דרך הגבול לסלובקיה והונגריה, והרוב של הקבוצה ניצלה. So you were basically responsible for saving a lot of people and therefore you are given this honor today. And not, uh, not only the, um, then in Hungary, this group of people which uh, was uh, in the Hanorats unit was a Zionist uh, group of uh, young people, young people continued the underground uh, Budapest. Uh, the underground uh, 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 activity. activity in Budapest uh, and uh, I uh, met my husband in Budapest in the underground in this group and uh, we continued the activity we uh, produced uh, false papers and uh, until the, the Russian uh, um, came uh, 18th of uh, January 45 and liberated us. How do you, how do you feel today? I'm very happy that the Nazis were incapable of destroying you. כן, ואנחנו לחמנו בשביל להציל את השם של היהודים. We also, this group of people, constructed here in Israel a school in Kibbutz Tel Yitzchak, which is called Masu'a. And children and children and uh, you, young people from our schools in Israel and from abroad coming there and studying for three, four days the period of Holocaust. Does the mood change year from year? Does it get less and less or it's always the same when you come to Yom HaShoah, the Day of Remembrance? It's the same, it's more even. It gets worse. It's not it's, uh, We are aware of, of it. And we want to... to um, um, to give it ov over to our children and to our grandchildren. We, we are here with our grandson, for instance. You watch Direct Line every week? Yes. Um, pretty much watch it every week, yes. You're going to watch it this week? I hope so. Why? Because I'd like to see your views on some of the events occurring at present. The Yom HaShoah We're talking to Mr. and Mrs. Pomerantz from New York and their son who are visiting Israel. Obviously, I think Holocaust survivors also? Yes, they are. How do you feel? I think that it's very impressive to come here and to see it. And I think that your show is the very most educated show for the youngsters and for the elderly people in America. I hope they will watch it, and they should watch every day. Every Sunday especially, because I think they can learn more about Israel than they can ever learn. Thank you. How is Mrs. Pomeranz tonight? I'm very impressed with everything I see here, but it's not the first time we are here. And we hope to see it on your show in the future. It's very, very impressive to see. When you grew up, did you feel anything special uh, about the Holocaust? Did your parents discuss it with you? Uh, obviously, since both my parents are Holocaust survivors, I've sort of grown up uh, as a, a son of a Holocaust survivor, it's been integrated into my lifestyle. So it's not removed from me as it is for many of the grandchildren. I sort of live it every day. I think the fact that we're here right now is symbolic of that. And we do it we're at Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum of the world. I mean, there is no other in comparison. We're standing at the foothills of Jerusalem, 
every year this is commemorated this way, I guarantee that there won't be another Holocaust if we continue on this path of, of meeting in Israel and of, of remembering our fallen heroes. As a matter of fact, this monument is symbolic of that. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising truly symbolizes the spirit of what we're trying to convey, that we'll never lay down and die, that the fight will never end. Mr. Pomerantz, where were you during the war? I was in the underground as a partisan, and I fought for two and a half years against the Germans. We went out, a lot of us survived, only few of us. But whoever survived, we at least feel that we did our share to do what we could do to defend the honor of our people. Did you meet after the war or during yes, the war? Yes, we met after the war. I was uh, in prison in Siberia. During you were under Russian control? Yes, and in 1945 we came back to Poland and we met. And then after a while we came to the United States and we married. How would you compare the Soviet uh, uh, imprisonment to the... Obviously you can't compare well, it to the German, but do you, I'm sure time, you and your husband talk at about it. At that time when we were in prison we thought this is the worst, that nobody could possibly survive something. We didn't think that we would survive, but after we came to Poland and we saw what happened, then our prison was bad. How many pounds bad. did you weigh when you came out of Siberia? <laughs> I was about 80 pounds. <laughs> Mr. Pomerantz? We tried to live like human beings because we had good guns and good machine guns. And this survived us. If we would have not had any guns and fought, not only the German, even the Polish people and the nationalist people, we would have never survived. Thanks for coming, Mr. Pomerantz. Thank you. It's our pleasure York. to be here. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Standing here for direct line with Harry Wolf of Elizabeth, New Jersey, and Jack Burston, also of New Jersey. From Springfield, Springfield New Jersey. New Jersey. Two Holocaust survivors and two viewers of our show, I believe. Yeah. Jack, how do you feel tonight? Well, I feel very sad that six million have perished. And I feel very good that I had the time to live until now and to be at this gathering. And I would never, I think it was uh, the wildest dreams. I would never think that I would be here in Jerusalem for that occasion. Great. Harry, I know you for quite a while and your brother Joe. I know you have a, a terrific story of how you escaped uh, the Nazis. Wasn't that through Russia, I think, Harry? Yeah, we were fortunate enough to be a deported to Russia and spend the years during the war in Russia. But nevertheless, we lost a lot of relatives. And this evening is a very sad evening for all of us when we remember all the people which perished in Holocaust. But on the other side, I was sitting, I was proud to see the wonderful young people coming to this celebration to show all our enemies that the final solution was a defeat and the Jewish people are living again and they are, came here to remember the victims of the terrible Holocaust which has taken place to try to wipe out our nation. Harry, I know that you have grandchildren. Do you think your grandchildren can anyway comprehend what you lived through? With it's, it's very difficult. It is our duty to keep conveying to them the message that they should strengthen themselves and strengthen the ties with the state of Israel, that something similar should never happen and the Jewish people should always be alert that they are enemies surrounding us and we should develop the inner and the outer strength to be able to fight off all attempts in the future. Jack, right. briefly, how did you escape? I half and half like I was uh, a part of it with the German people. I come from a famous town, Helm, they call. And I was part of uh, my mother and sister. Oh, my mother and sisters and relatives, the women were left at the German side, and my father and two brothers went to the Russian side. So I was doing both sides. Then I joined the partisans. And in 1944, I joined voluntarily the Polish army. And uh, I don't have to tell you what the Holocaust was. Were you an officer was. or a corporal? 
I was, I started as a corporal. Now during that war, you advanced every week. When they progressed with the front, they gave you every, every week a higher rank. You could have find up being a general. As a matter of fact, I went for a mission to Russia in 1944, and I was a staff sergeant, you know. Staff sergeant? Yes, yeah, staff sergeant. And I made myself a nice uniform, you know, with nice boots. So the Russian officers used to salute me first. In 1944, yeah. They're still doing it, Jack. Oh, yeah. Anyway, thank you for coming. Anyway, this should never happen. You know, they killed six million Jewish people. Children, and others, a million and, others. and others, and a million half children, and this disaster should never happen again. Thank you. Okay. Jack, thank you. Harry? Thanks. 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 Harry, Chicago.